Since the time of Newton, the basic paradigm of mathematical physics and engineering has consisted of four steps. First, understand the physics of the process being studied. Second, develop a mathematical model of the process. If the process involves change, then the mathematical model will consist of differential equations. Third, solve or compute solutions to the differential equations. Newton developed analytic calculus to solve differential equations in the 17th century. Euler developed methods of computing solutions to differential equations in the 18th century, but they were not really practical till the advent of computers. In mathematical modeling and computational calculus 1, we used Euler's method to compute solutions to ordinary differential equations, that is, differential equations with one independent variable and that variable was always time. In mathematical modeling and computational calculus 2, we will use the finite difference method, which is Euler's method extended to partial differential equations, to compute solutions to partial differential equations with two or three independent variables, time, and one or two spatial variables. The fourth step in the paradigm is to analyze the results of step three. In this series of videos, the analysis will usually consist of drawing graphs or creating animations. We'll start with heat transfer, and in this video we'll stick with steady state heat transfer in one dimension. First, the physics. Heat transfer is governed by Fourier's heat transfer law. In one dimension, temperature is represented by a function, big T, of time, little t, and position, x. Fourier's heat transfer law states that q, the heat energy flow rate, equals minus k, where k is the thermal conductivity constant of the material, times the spatial derivative of temperature, that is, the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x. The units of heat energy are joules. q, in one dimension, is the heat flow rate and is measured in joules per second or watts. The minus sign indicates that heat flows from areas of high temperature to areas of low temperature. The units of the thermal conductivity constant K are watts divided by degrees Kelvin divided by M so that when K is multiplied by the spatial derivative of temperature the result is in watts. T is temperature in degrees Kelvin. We need one more fact and we're ready to go. That's the relationship between temperature and heat energy. The relationship is linear and given by the equation heat energy equals C, the heat capacity of the material, times V, volume, times temperature. And we'll usually write it as temperature equals 1 over C times heat energy divided by volume. The graphs illustrate Fourier's heat transfer law in one dimension. The first graph shows a linearly increasing heat profile in a one meter, one dimensional object like a thin wire. The slope of the temperature profile is constant and calculated as 50 degrees minus 30 degrees over one meter or 20 degrees K per meter. So the heat flow rate is constant at every point in the wire. With K equal 0.2 watts per degree per meter, we can use Fourier's heat transfer law to calculate the heat flow rate in the wire as minus 4 joules per second with heat flowing right to left. 
In the second graph, the temperature profile is again linear, this time decreasing. So the spatial derivative of temperature is constant, and the heat flow rate is constant, this time left to right. If we choose a section of the wire delimited by XA and XB, then the heat flow rate into the section at XA equals the heat flow rate out at XB, so the section is not gaining or losing heat, and its temperature is constant. This represents a steady state condition. In the third graph, the temperature profile is varying. And where it is decreasing, for example, at x sub a, heat is flowing left to right. Given the slope of the temperature profile at x sub a, we can calculate the flow rate as positive 4 joules per second. Where the temperature profile is increasing, for example, at x sub b, at a rate of 15 degrees per meter, heat is flowing to the left at a calculated rate of minus 3 joules per second. Since heat is flowing into the section of wire between x sub a and x sub b from both ends, that section of wire is heating up. Knowing the physics, we're ready to derive the differential equation model for 1D steady state heat transfer. Steady state means that temperature is not changing with time, and hence the heat flow rate is also not changing with time, so both temperature and flow rate are functions of x only. We will consider the heat flow rate into a small section of a one-dimensional object, the control volume, shown in the diagram as the section between x and x plus dx. From the diagram, a positive flow rate, q, at the left end of the control volume, at x, represents heat flowing into the control volume, and a positive flow rate at the right end of the control volume, at x plus dx, represents heat flowing out of the control volume. Since the temperature of the control volume is not changing, it must be the case that the heat flow rate out of the control volume equals the heat flow rate into the control volume, and hence Q of x equals Q of x plus dx. From Fourier's heat transfer law, Q of x equals minus K times the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x at x, and Q of x plus dx equals minus K times the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x at x plus dx. So the partial derivative of temperature with respect to x is constant, and the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to x is zero, and that's our differential equation model for the 1D steady state heat transfer process. So we have our first problem, a 1D wire of length 4 meters with the left end held at the fixed temperature of 20 degrees K and the right end held at a constant 100 degrees K. And we wait until the system has reached steady state. Note that in steady state, or at any time, there's no transfer of heat from the wire to the environment anywhere but at the endpoints. So you can think of the wire as being fully insulated. We subdivide the total volume, in this case length, of the object into four subsections delimited by a grid of five points, x sub 1, x sub 2, dot, 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 x sub 5, with x sub 1 being the left endpoint and x sub 5 being the right endpoint. Our goal is to calculate the steady state temperatures at the interior grid points. The model is the differential equation, the second partial derivative of temperature with respect to x is zero, and the method we'll use is the finite difference method. The finite difference method is an extension of Euler's method to partial differential equations, and we will make the finite difference method substitution for the derivative in the model. First, we'll derive the finite difference method substitution for a second order partial derivative. We start with the equation used in the definition of second order partial derivatives, equation 1, and we'll use it as the basis for the derivation. We make the Euler substitution for the first order derivatives in equation 1, giving equation 2. And we simplify that equation to get equation 3, and that's it. 
we have the finite difference method substitution for second order partial derivatives. Since in the steady state temperature does not vary with time, we'll drop the time variable t from the equation to get equation 4, and applying the equation to the grid points xi, we get equation 5. The first equation shows the result of making the finite difference method substitution for the second order spatial derivative in the model written in mathematical notation. That is, t is a mathematical function defined on the real line, and the x sub i's are real number coordinates. The result is a linear equation containing the unknown values for the temperatures at the grid points. We will calculate the temperatures at the grid points using MATLAB and store them in an array and we'll name the array T, so we don't forget what it is. We'll store the temperature calculated for the ith grid point, that is, at x sub i, in the ith element of the MATLAB array T. We can, and will, write the computational equation in index notation, where T is the name of the array, as shown in equation 2. Using index notation, we have linear equations for each of the interior grid points. These are for i equals 2, we have 0 equals t3 minus 2 times t2 plus t1. For i equals 3, we have 0 equals t4 minus 2 times t3 plus t2. And for i equals 4, we have 0 equals t5 minus 2 t4 plus t3. So, from the model, we have a linear equation for each interior point in the grid. Note that we also have linear equations for the boundary points, T1 equals 20, and T5 equals 100. So we have five linear equations and five unknowns, and we can use the standard linear algebra techniques to solve them. We do this by constructing the coefficient array A and the constant array D, then with the array T representing the array of unknown temperatures, we have, using matrix notation, A times T equals D, as shown on the slide. This equation is solved for T by multiplying both sides of the equation by A inverse, giving T equals A inverse times D. Here is the MATLAB code for setting up the arrays. Note that D is entered as a column vector so that the matrix multiplication will work. And we also have a few instructions to plot the results. The differential equation model gives us a linear equation for each interior grid point. But the FDM substitution doesn't work to produce an equation for the boundary points, and we need a linear equation for each point. There are three common types of boundary conditions, Dirichlet, Neumann, and Robin. A Dirichlet boundary condition is used to specify a fixed value of the variable at the boundary. So to specify that the value of temperature at the left boundary is a fixed 100 degrees, the linear equation is T1 equals 100. A Neumann boundary condition is used to specify the value of the spatial derivative of the variable at the boundary. So, for example, to specify that the spatial derivative of temperature at the left boundary equals C, the equation would be the approximation to the partial derivative at the boundary, that is, T2 minus T1 divided by dx equals C, which gives us the linear equation T2 minus T1 equals C times dx. A Robin boundary condition is used to specify a general linear relationship between the value of a variable at the boundary and its derivative at the boundary. We'll cover Robin boundary conditions in the next video. Here we modify the first example to have a Neumann boundary condition on the left boundary and the boundary condition is that the spatial derivative of temperature equals 10. Approximation to the spatial derivative of temperature on the left boundary is given by T2 minus T1 divided by dx, and we want that to be 10, so that gives us the linear equation 
T2 minus T1 equals 10 times dx, and that's represented in the matrix equation as shown. So looking at the A array, the first row has a minus 1 in the column corresponding to T1, and a 1 in the column corresponding to T2, and the constant is 10 times dx. So at the bottom of the page is the code for setting it up. Now we need to specify dx, which we do as 0.5. We enter the A and D matrices by hand, and the solution is given by T equals inverse A times D. This is the result. Note that the temperature at the right boundary is 100 as specified, and the slope of the line is given by 100 minus 80 over 2, which is 10. So that's the slope at the left boundary, and also the slope for the entire line since it's linear. In this example, we specify a Dirichlet boundary condition on the left boundary with T1 equals 0. And we specify a Neumann boundary condition on the right boundary with the spatial derivative of temperature specified as minus 2. An equation for that is T5 minus T4 over dx equals minus 2. We also pin the temperature at the third grid point to be 10. So we also change the third linear equation to be T3 equals 10. So you can see the matrix set up in the middle of the page, and the code to create the matrices is given at the bottom, along with the plot command to graph the results. The assignment is to reproduce the results in the video. You've seen all the code, but it's important to enter the code and execute the statements yourself to get a feel for what's going on. Oh, yeah.